Welcome to Sodexo Global Lean Six Sigma for Services. We teach this as a leadership course and we teach it in small bites. If you like the course, click like at the bottom of the screen. If you want to get notifications of future classes, please subscribe to this channel. This is part two of a three-part class. In this class, we'll cover the measure step and the analyze step. Here is the purpose of part two of DMAIC. We'll talk about the measure step and the analyze step. For each of these, I am going to go through the IPO, the Input Process Output Diagram. And for each of these two steps, I strongly recommend that you use the checklist that I provided to you in our training materials, at least the, the first several times when you go through a DMAIC process. We'll talk about what can go wrong in Measure and Analyze, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the tools you might use. You, have, you may have heard the saying, if it is important, it is being measured. Well, in the measure step, we measure something. You recall in the define step, we gave a snapshot of some occurrence. Uh, at the moment the project began, we had sales of this much. We had a survey response of this amount. We had a temperature of whatever. But we had a snapshot of data, just one data point. In the measure step, we talk about how we got up to that data point and how we're going to collect data throughout the remaining time of the project. We collect data on what we call CTQs, things that are critical to quality. In the define step, we named a problem and we should have named at least one thing that is critical to quality, turnover rate, temperature, the time it takes to do something. For each CTQ, that was listed in the defined step, we can choose then to keep it or throw it out. But for the ones we choose to keep, we must define how we got to that point by getting data from the past. I go back two years if the data are available. And then I look at exactly how the data were collected to make sure that we are consistent. If we haven't been consistent in the past, we might have bad data. If we have not been consistent in the past and we haven't established a method for collecting the data, we, not be, we might not be collecting data very well throughout the project. So we have to define how the data are collected and make sure that we're collecting the data consistently. When we define how we're going to collect the data and what data we're going to collect, we try to not cut it in stone, but we try to stay as stable as possible. Once we've defined a metric for our CTQs, we define a method for the data collection, we have to stick with it. If we find it's unworkable, then as a team, we go back and we change the method. Here's an IPO for measure. Here's what you, now notice the inputs are the outputs from the define step. These outputs are the inputs for the analyze step. And here is what you do when you're inside the measure step. You write a plan on how you're going to collect data. Not just the data that got you up to the defined step, but how you're going to collect data as you go through the project itself. Sometimes you will plot data. Sometimes you'll make graphs. Sometimes you'll dig into analyses before you get to the analyze step. And we'll talk about all of this as we go through the course in the classroom. But it is important that you have a good baseline and you understand how everything that you're doing or everything in the process that you're drawing flows value to the client or the customer or the patient. Now notice the outputs. The last one of these is a contract for change. Sometimes when you're doing the measure step, you actually write up a document that says, I'm going to stick with the project until I'm done something to that effect and everyone signs it and the reason that you wait to sign a contract for change just a symbolic gesture it's not a legal contract is because people wanted to see they want to see the metrics before they sign up for something they don't want to agree that they're going to solve all the world's problems they want to agree that something finite something doable even though it might be a stretch is what they're signing up to do so we'll talk about a contract for change, and I'll give you a couple of examples, and there are examples in your book. A 
after I go through the measure step or while I'm going through it, I take a look at my checklist to make sure that I didn't miss anything. Did I miss defining the, the process? No. Do I know who's participating in the process? That's something you have to know. And always include the people that generally aren't included. That means that if when I'm running a project in a hospital that has something to do with environmental services, I have someone on the team who mops the floors. I have someone on the team who is a supervisor. I have somebody on the team who is the general manager. I might have the DM on the team. I might have one of the RVPs on the team. But we have everybody who represents every step in the process. A nurse would be handy to have in an, in an environmental services project. But please go down the checklist and see if it will help you or if there are modifications I should make to the yellow belt tool belt. Lots of things can go wrong in the measure step. The worst one, of course, is that the data can be biased or the data can be spotty. If they are, they're practically useless. Sometimes the process that we have isn't really a process at all. The process that you start with might be just a way that people do things because that's the way they've always been done. That's more of a practice than it is a process. If it's not formalized, if it's done by um, institutional memory, it certainly isn't a process, it's a practice. Sometimes you are process rich. You have lots and lots of processes to do the same thing. Which one are you going to choose? Which ones are you going to retire? Which one are you going to formalize? One problem is who owns it? When you have a process and you have a project, you need a sponsor who is going to tell you who owns the process. It might be the sponsor. It probably is. If it's not the sponsor, get them to define the person who owns it and get that person onto your team. Oh, sometimes the data that we use, the tools that we use, aren't very good for collecting data. In the measure step, we define what we're going to use to collect data for the rest of the project. This is where you have to go to someone who has done a similar project before, unless it's within your experiences, and define the tools that you're going to use and the system you're going to use to collect data. You can't collect inaccurate data and expect to have accurate results when you get to the control step, when you're ready to end the project. In the measure step, you define the metric you're going to use that will say you're actually done. Remember how you were in the define step and you were defining the exit criteria, or the exit criterion, singular? You have to have a way to accurately define that point. What is success? Uh, there should be only one definition of success in your project. Well, here I'm giving you an example of bad data. This is a project I did in Brazil where the data collection forms for years had been written in English even though the company who was running the project knew full well that the people spoke Portuguese or French. As you can imagine, some of the data were, were not correct. Some of the forms were not filled out correctly. We also found that the U.S. company was pointing at the Brazilians saying everything was their fault, and the Brazilians were pointing at the U.S. company saying everything was the fault of the U.S. company. What they didn't see in this logistics um, project, what most people didn't understand thoroughly was that everything was barcoded and that every time something moved through the system it was scanned. And so there was a, gate, a way to get very precise data and by taking the time and writing another batch code that would go through and pull all the data for us, so we could see exactly how long it took something to move through their repair and return process. And we found out the Brazilians were correct. Uh, the U.S. company was making many, many errors in the way they pushed uh, hardware through the uh, repair and return system. So oh, please be careful when you're looking at your measurement tools and be sure that the people who are filling them in or providing the data at least understand the tools. Here's an example. Here are two examples of the contract for change. One is one we did with the uh, United Kingdom Ministry of Defense. One is one we did with Talos Raytheon. The one that's handwritten here was written by the CEO himself. He took a piece of uh, butcher paper 
and wrote all over it. And he said, sign it. If you believe in it, if you're going to stay on my team, sign it. And he posted this on an easel out in the hallway. And people we didn't even know, people who were not members of the team, came by to sign it because they thought it was a neat thing to sign. With the UK Ministry of Defense, everybody who signed this stayed with the project to the very end. It was quite a successful project. Uh, it's good to have a contract for change. People all wanted a copy of it. They thought it was a great souvenir to have of a very successful project. Now, what do you do in the analyze step? In define, you define. In the measure step, you measure. In the analyze step, you get to root cause. You thoroughly understand the process, you prioritize faults, and you get to root cause. Uh, if you remember nothing about the analyze step other than you get to root cause, please remember that. Analyze is the step where we have most of our tools. This is where we become very good statisticians or we sometimes fail. Uh, here, we might go into depth on how a process really works. We look at the data, we plot it, we plan it, we project it forward, we figure out exactly what's going on and what we project to go on. And we get to root cause by using, uh, at this level, one of three different ways, one of three different methods. And we'll go into each of these in detail in, in our root cause class. But analyze step is where you get to root cause. Analyze step is also, <coughs> since you have the root cause, you figure out what the solutions are going to be and how to implement them. And you draft a plan to actually enact your solutions. So in the analyze step, you draft a plan. It's not the final plan, but you at least draft one, so that will get you into the next step. Here's the IPO for the analyze step. You have to have a very thorough understanding of the process and so forth. But you can read this, and, and as we go through the course, you'll be practicing this. And most everything, or many of the things that we do, throughout the two days when we're uh, in the classroom will be directed towards the analyze step because we have to get that correct. Here's my checklist. Please go through the checklist as before and make sure that everything is correct. Um, <clears throat> we haven't gone over the leverage matrix. You'll learn that in the Greenbelt class. But we will go over three methods to find root cause. We'll look at different ways. We'll get an understanding of what an experiment is and how to design an experiment. We'll talk about that more in depth in our classroom experience. But the main thing to remember is in the analyze step, you get to root cause. What can go wrong with the analyze step? Well, you use tools wrong. A lot of people have a favorite tool, and they try to apply it to every problem. might not be the best way to go about it. People make errors, especially in some of the statistics that we do. It's easy to make errors by data entry or by using an incorrect method by using um, a common software package. Software makes mistakes. Whatever you do statistically, ask somebody to check your work. I still do. I've been doing statistics much of my life. And that is many, many years. And I always ask somebody to find out why I could be wrong. Look for my errors. If I don't find any, if the person who looks to check my work doesn't find any errors, I have greater confidence that what I did was correct. <coughs> In the analyze step, we also come up with solutions. And some of these can be comical. And some of the methods we use to come up with solutions are methods children would use. But we use them because they are effective, because they cause us to use our imagination to be a little bit creative. We'll talk about a couple of these methods. And you'll find that as an adult, you've probably learned established ways of thinking. You've learned ways that were taught to you by senior people who did very, very well. And that's because they had a great deal of experience under their belt, and they, uh, they used solutions that had worked for them before. Sometimes you come up with a new problem, a different type of problem. And there isn't an easy solution. There isn't a solution that's been found before. You have to come up with one. So this is a time to stimulate your imagination. Be very creative. Come up with something that works. Sometimes in the analyze step, the solutions we come up with are just so complex, we'll never get them done. 
Nobody understands how to apply the solution, so they won't even attempt it. And sometimes we have subject matter experts that say, it won't work. I've tried it, it doesn't work. Or they'll just say, it doesn't work because I, have, I don't know about it. Um, that can be the most difficult one to fight. But when I have a person who's disagreeable, what I tend to do is put them in charge of the thing with which they disagree. I don't like that solution. It's not going to work. And so I'll say, okay, you know what? You're in charge of making that solution happen. Give it a shot. See what you can do. I understand it's difficult. I understand nobody's been able to do it before. But you have the background. You have the capabilities. Give it a shot. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes all they wanted was to take leadership of something. And they'll do a very, very good job for you. And do you know what sub-optimization is? Sometimes when you're fixing, fixing a process, you fix one little part of it, and then whatever is on either side of the process fails because it doesn't have the feed or the pull that it, that it had before. Uh, the, uh, one way to remember sub-optimization is to look at half of the weightlifters you'll see in the gym. They have a great big upper body and little bitty legs. They've sub-optimized. They made something work harder than something else or something work better than something else. So when you're dealing with a part of a process, a process that fits in with other processes, make sure you're not damaging everybody else by making yours look good. <clears throat> Here I am, a much younger me, working with uh, Boeing Aircraft Company on a project for the V-22 Osprey system. It was a shared process. Boeing owned half of the process. My company owned half of the process. We were having a tough time working together because each one of us wanted to be in charge. So we just put everybody in the room together, and I ran the Lean Six Sigma part of it, but I used the tools that were given to me by the chief engineer from Boeing. It was the only way we could get ourselves to work together, and they enjoyed it. They had a very good time. We came up with an excellent project that cut down and repair and return. You see this mess? It's not really a mess if you if you go through it step by step, but it looks complex. But this is how we repaired and returned parts for the V-22 Osprey. It worked. We got it to work better, and we got we cut it down to more. Well, we cut it down by more than 50 percent. Quite a success when you improve a a repair and return process. Here's what we talked about in Demaic Part 2. We talked about the measure step and the analyze step. Now keep in mind, this presentation is a supplement to the book. Please read the book. There's a lot more detail in it. But in the measure step, we talked briefly about how we collect data and describing how we got to the current state, how we're going to collect data consistently from then on out. I did mention, and it's in the checklist, that we should define our as-is processes, that the way we got to where we are, the way we're doing things right now. And I should state that a lot of people think that they have a process when they really don't. They have a way they do something because they remember how they used to do it. And we call that a practice, not a process. And then we talked a little bit about the contract for change. In the analyze step, we talked about getting to root cause. And you know, there can be a lot of problems that lead to the root cause. We have to identify the problems or faults or undesirable effects, UDEs, and we have to find a way of getting to the root cause of each one of these that's associated with the CTQ, something that's critical to quality. In the analyze step, we figure out how we're going to fix things and we draft a plan to get it done. Thank you for attending this Sodexo Lean Six Sigma training. If you like this course, please click the thumbs up icon below the screen. If you want to be notified when additional courses are added or when courses are modified, please subscribe to this channel by clicking the red subscribe button also located below the screen. I wish you the best.